At the same time, <laughs> no pun intended, um, we're only covering a handful of verses. So where we're at tonight is chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. So it's not a whole lot of verses. And technically, the carryover into chapter 6 is the same thought, but I just thought we'll just end at the chapter break as opposed to, to going on. So maybe we'll, we'll, um, we'll be able to, I don't want to say retain, but that kind of has to do with what our, our lesson's on a little bit too. But maybe we'll be able to digest a little better if we have just a handful of verses as opposed to try to pack too many of them in. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, does somebody want to read verses 11 through 14? We'll just have one person read them all. And Matt? Oh, yeah, Mr. Cannon. But you've got to pray after you read them. <laughs> we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be here tonight, Lord. We pray that you'd bless this time, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I chuckle. Are we, is there something? <laughs> we are spread. Maybe I should teach right there in the middle, and then it'll be, what? <laughs> After 37 years of marriage, Fran and I, <laughs> Matt is 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 an interesting guy. He is a front row Baptist. That, that normally doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a front row Baptist. But Matt, that's what you are. Uh, does anybody have in their Bibles subheadings? I have subheadings throughout my Bible. What what does yours say? Mm-hmm. Yes. Anybody else? It it is. We are in somewhat of a parenthesis, warning against falling away. Um, mine is warning against apostasy. So all of those things are, are pretty much the same thing. But what, what we're into now, or, or what we'll be into for a little period, is um, what Roy said, a parenthetical portion of it. it. It's kind of putting a parenthesis about there's a flow of study that's taking place in Hebrews chapter 7. Did I shame you, Elizabeth? <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a, there's a flow of study that's taking place. Does anybody remember the last time? It's been, it's been a few weeks that well, when we were I in this. I wasn't here for the previous one, and then we had the fellowship. That's before, right. So okay. So you can bring this up. This the, okay. The last time we had talked about Melchizedek, and I found out some people pronounce it Melchizedek, which I do not. <laughs> so, um, but we were talking about Melchizedek, and we're talking about how Jesus is our high priest, with the supremacy over all other earthly high priests who came through Levi, where Melchizedek doesn't come through that Levitical line. He has no beginning, no end, which is, is a segue into Jesus being our eternal high priest, having no beginning, thus him being eternal, but then having a high priesthood, which doesn't end because... In the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. <laughs> no, you can pronounce it however you want. Yes, in the order of Melchizedek. Because you said when, when we had our preaching service, you had mentioned that he was higher than Melchizedek. Oh, he is. Okay. Oh, yes, he's higher. Okay. Yes, he, I he, he was Melchizedek. No, 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 no. And that, you bring up an interesting point, and I don't want to belabor this too much, and this isn't in any modern commentaries. It's kind of a new thing, and maybe I just got onto something wacky. I don't know. But... Um, there is a conspiracy out there that, that people are conspiring against um, the, the Jewish leaders. And, and maybe it is true. And maybe it even happened. Some people go for, as far back as, as the time of the Apostle Paul. And it relates to other writings that Paul said. But there are, there are people who th say that the, the rabbis teach that Melchizedek is actually Seth. No, 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 not Seth. I'm trying to think. Through the, the sons of Noah. I don't even know if I'm going to look it up. Um, through the sons of Noah. It's, I don't want to go too far with this. It's, it's one of the sons of Noah. And Shem. It's Shem. That Melchizedek is Shem. And therefore, if Melchizedek is actually Shem, then he does come through like this Levitical line. And therefore, Jesus can't be 
a high priest through Melchizedek because he's through Levitical line, so he can't really be a high priest because he's not from the tribe of Levi. I mean, it gets kind of wacky. I'm not going there, and I, and, and I just throw that out there because it is a modern thing talking about he's Melchizedek. in the order of Melchizedek. Yes. Now, what, what they're saying is, but the order of Melchizedek is actually the order of Seth, which is ultimately the order of... Okay. Basically, they're discrediting Jesus not because he's not from the line of Levi or from the tribe um, coming through the Levitical line. So therefore, he can't really be a high priest. Now, again, you just take that for, for what it's worth. I, I don't think that's accurate when you look at the scripture. I don't think you can really determine that, especially on the days of Abraham and stuff. But um, regardless of that, that's um, Jesus being compared to Melchizedek. Now, we're, we're dropping it off right here. We're going to pick it back up in chapter 7. So, well, even probably before that. But the idea is, what we're, what we're into tonight especially, is, is what has been called a pastoral um, parenthesis. Or this is a, a pastoral aspect to the writing of Hebrews or to, to the writing of this group of people. Because he's, he's going to... He's going to kind of lay hard on them a little bit because they're up to something that's not good. And so as opposed to just teaching them, he's going to, he's going to be a pastor to them. And um, it's kind of interesting what, what he's saying. Now, I want, to, I want to share something with you guys. I was, I, I'd forgotten about this. and Maybe that's good or bad. I don't know. But I had, I had taken a course um, throughout the book of Hebrews in seminary. And, uh, and it was a good class, and, and I, was, I was going through, and I have, I have a, um, a commentary that was our textbook. And so today I picked it up, and I thought, well, what is this, what is this saying about this? And I was, I was extremely disappointed. Now, I didn't know and didn't recognize this when I took the class, but the commentary from my seminary class absolutely does me no good whatsoever because it is based on the fact that this is written to unbelieving Jews, and I read it, and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, how? And everything he was saying, well, this is to lost people who are getting real close and all this stuff. And I just, I thought, man, this, this throws, when you, when you take it from that beginning, it really does, I don't want to say pervert, but, but it, it, it throws things in a direction that, number one, we're not seeing it that way. But then I went back, and I thought, well, where is he getting this from? Let me go back to the beginning, and I'm not going to mention any names about the, the writer of it, but... Um, but then I thought, okay, let me just go back to the beginning of it. And you guys don't need to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 1 says, Long ago, long ago at many times, um, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But as he's going through this, and as he's recognizing who he's writing to, I think there's no doubt that he's writing, yes, to Jewish people, but in the context of them being believers, not of them being unbelievers. And I think that's really, really, really important um, because he speaks about them knowing Jesus, not about them needing to know Jesus. And, and then you can get that throughout a lot of different places throughout the scripture. Therefore, holy brothers, he calls them holy brothers who share uh, in a heavenly calling. I don't think the writer of Hebrews would just kind of throw that out there to people who aren't believers. I don't think that's what's going on. So anyway, it's, it's one man's interpretation, and, but it does kind of throw things off. When you're not seeing it from the context that I believe we are biblically in that this is written, yes, to Jewish people, but Jewish believers, it, it, it's, it would change exactly how I would, I would teach this. Because I think the warning here is against falling away from the faith, not rejecting the faith. And that's the difference. The commentary is about, well, this is people on the verge of rejecting faith. I, I don't think that's what's going on. What he's, who he's talking to, I almost said tonight, <laughs> who we're referencing tonight are Christians. But as one commentator says, basically, the writer of Hebrews is telling this group, group of people, it's time to grow up. And that's, that's a pastoral kind of thing. He's recognizing where they are in their, um, in their walk with the Lord and in, their, in, their, in the maturation process of growing in Christ as a believer, and they are not where they should be. And, and, so, and he tells them that. And that's, what this, that's why it's kind of a parenthesis, because we're in the middle of being taught about Melchizedek and how Jesus is the high priest from that order, but yet is supreme over him. But then he kind of takes, 
takes a little time to explain something, and he gets right into it in verse 11. About this, and now that's what my version says. I don't know if anybody else says different. Chapter 5, verse 11. Um, anybody else have anything different than in that in verse 11? Mine says about this. Of whom? Of whom? Okay. Many things to say. Yes. Of whom is a perfect, it's a great way of doing it because that also explains who are we talking about? He's talking about Melchizedek. So he's still in the, in the process of teaching about Melchizedek or about this of whom he's got a lot to say to this group of believers and he wants to say it. However, here comes the rebuke. And it's not a, and here's the thing about it. You know, when, when the scripture and we're called, there are times we need to be rebuked, but, but there's also an edification aspect to being rebuked. It's not just rebuked, you're beat down and stay down. It's sometimes we need to be disciplined by the Lord because we are children, but, but, he, but he does it in a way to build us up. It's not, it, the writer of Hebrews here is not just taking these people down and just leaving them and kind of putting his knee on their throat and, and not letting them be able to, to move up. Um, he's doing this. He's doing it in a very loving way, but he's doing it for their benefit because he's got more he wants to do. And he's going to teach more about Melchizedek, but he just has to take a pause for a second. And again, remember, all this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So these people need to hear this. And maybe some of us need to hear it too. About this, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain. The teaching of Melchizedek and seeing Jesus through a line of high priest who's not really a Levitical high priest, you know, for, for Jewish believers, but also we're getting into some deep stuff. This isn't just surface stuff. I wouldn't teach this to children, <laughs> if that makes sense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be teaching on the, on the order of Melchizedek to in, in Sunday or not in Sunday school, but in like a VBS. I, I just that's not where I would go. Why? Because we're getting into some deep stuff. This is some hard stuff. This is stuff where you and I have to really begin to think deeply on this. It's not just surface stuff. Now there is surface stuff that we teach, but he's saying I got more to say to you, and it's hard to explain. This is this is not just. You know, real simple, like, man, I get it. It's, it's, we're going to have to go deep on some things to understand who Melchizedek is and why Jesus is a high priest through him and what that means to his ministry now and what he's able to do on our behalf. So this is, this is deep stuff. And he says, I, I want to explain this to you, but it's hard to explain because on one half, it's hard for you to receive since you've become dull of hearing. That's pretty, pretty harsh. Basically, what he's saying is you become sluggish. You become lazy. In what regards? Yeah. Well, and again, he's what I have always, when I read this, mm -hmm. and what I've always kind of thought about it is he's talking about that sacrificial system that, that Jesus kind of fulfilled in the order of Melchizedek, being that, that he was above all priests before or after him. Right. And, and, what they didn't want to hear was that that sacrificial system is all they knew was was over now. That that's part of it, um, but it's also it's not that they didn't want to hear it; it's that they couldn't hear it because they have grown lazy, and and ultimately what they're growing lazy in is is understanding the truth of Scripture. Now, for at this time, it probably would have been studying of the Old Testament, but basically what he's saying to them is, is you're sluggish, you're dull of hearing, you've, you've, you're not, well, let me put it this way. There, there comes a point, and, and this is, this is a quote, and it's kind of a, an end of a quote, but, but it says that in Christ, and I'm kind of, the first part's mine, and the second part will be the quote, but as we grow in our faith in Christ, there comes a point where we, as Christians, are learning to take responsibility for our own growth. There has to be a point in our Christian life where we have to begin taking a little responsibility for our growth. Now, I'm not getting into um, sanctification and those things. I'm talking about growing in the Bible, learning what it says, applying that to your life, um, we have, to, we have to take some responsibility on that. We've got to start getting in the Word of God ourselves and studying it and digging deep. And, and not just when something gets too hard, because I've, I've come across this. I've had people tell me this from time to time, especially about the book of Leviticus. Oh, it's too hard. I don't, I don't touch it. Well, 
if you don't touch it, and if you don't go there, and you don't... First off, who teaches us when we come to the Bible? The Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. So if we come to something we don't understand, what should we do? Ask. Yeah, we should ask. Ask questions. Ask the Holy Spirit questions, Fran. <laughs> now, my, my point is, you know, it's, it's real easy to come to something hard and difficult and just shut the Bible and be like, well, I don't... Ugh. Man, that's, I just can't go there. I'm not smart. That's what people, I'm not smart enough. Like you have to have some kind of theological education to receive the Holy Spirit. That's, that's not it. But then the man that wrote the commentary on Hebrews, somehow he got off on the line. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was one thing. Now, I will tell you this. When I had that commentary and when I read this in, in class, and, and the, the, the teacher was real good about, look, we don't adhere to everything in this. It's just the best commentary that's out at this point, which take that for what it's worth. But one of the things that commentary did, did teach that I didn't agree with, and I don't think my instructor or my professor did either, was that the fact that Jesus enters into a temple not made with human hands with his blood to present it as a sacrifice that it, he's not talking about his literal blood. And I said, forget that. I said, I, I think he is talking about his literal blood. And I think he took his blood up to heaven and went into the most holy place and said, here it is, because that's what happened down on earth. They would take that blood in there and they would sprinkle it. And he was looking at it kind of figuratively. I look at it as literally. So anyway, I don't want to get too much on that, that commentary. Um, but, but what we have to, we got to dig deep. In the scriptures, and, and sometimes that's that's hard. Sometimes, especially in our day and age, and I, I, you know, it was harder for them to get in the scriptures than it is for us today, because we have so many Bibles, we have so many versions, we have so many opportunities and ways to get in it. You know, we have phones that have Bible, all this stuff, um, and and yet the majority of people. Well, I want to be careful with that. Many people give the impression that they are not studying the Word of God on their own. The majority of people don't study. On I tell you, okay, you said it. <laughs> <laughs> Phyllis said that, by the way, not me. Um, no, it, it, but but sad to say, that's that's probably pretty accurate. And what I mean, I don't mean just reading the Bible, because you could ask people. I mean, you can get out of that one pretty easy. Well, do you read the Bible? Yeah, I read the Bible. Just read it. <laughs> you can get out of that one. And, and, and you can read the Bible and plow through it and get nothing out of it. But, but that's not what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here. He's talking about some deep study, some, some challenging study to where, again, we say, Holy Spirit, I don't understand this. So please teach me. I'm not just going to shut the Bible off. I'm not just going to push away what I don't understand. I'm not just going to say, well, I'm not a teacher or a pastor, so I don't have to understand this stuff. If that was the attitude of these Jewish believers, then the writer of Hebrews is saying that doesn't, that doesn't hold anything. That holds no merit. Because, listen, I want to teach you some deep stuff. And it's hard to explain, and you're not going to get it because you've become dull of hearing. And, and then he goes into verse 12. And this is why um, one commentator says it's time to grow up. It's, and this is what it leads into. Verse 12, for though by this time... You ought to be teachers. Now, a lot of people pause on that, and they're like, well, hey, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a pastor. So he's not talking to me. That's not what's being used here. That's not, the word is not what is used for pastor or even in that kind of vocation. What it means is, literally, for though by this time, you ought to be making disciples. Who's called to make disciples? Every single one of us, every single Christian. Not just, it's not just the pastor's job. It's not just the Sunday school teacher's job. Um, everyone. So, and, and in our, our day and age, you know, and, and I've probably done it in things as well. I know I have on certain things. Nothing comes to mind, but, but we're all guilty of this. We look for excuses out of things, out of responsibility. Hey, I'm not a teacher. That's not my gift. So therefore, this is not meant for me, and we, we kind of tune out at that point and say, well, this is meant for somebody else. You know, this is meant for all of us. If we're in Christ, just like these Jewish believers who were receiving this, they couldn't look to, to so-and-so next to them and say, hey, this is for you. You're a teacher. I'm not. I'm just a lay person. This isn't for me. So the indictment is on, as, as kind of a group here, 
Now, of course, within any group, there are those who are progressing, but there's, I would say the majority of them are not. And he knows this fellowship of believers intimately enough to be able to address them like this. He's not just picking something out of the sky and putting it down in here and saying, well, this maybe is applying to you. It is applying to them because he knows who they are and they know who he is and they respect his authority to have this letter and to, to let it be their teaching. So he says something interesting. For though by this time you ought to be teaching people. You ought to be making disciples. You ought to be teaching people deep truths of the scripture. But you need someone to teach you. And what's the next word? Now, I know what mine is, and I've got it. Elementary. Elementary. Anybody else have something? Well, before that. Now, when I come to that, I have basic principles. But before that, I ought to teach you again. Again is a very, very pivotal word in this whole discourse that he's saying to them. He's not saying, for though by this time uh, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. They've been taught. They have covered the basic elementary principles of the oracles of God. They have been taught this. And to be taught something, again, and I always try to make reference to this, um, in, in the scope of teaching, unless you can apply at some point what you've, what you've learned, to me, teaching falls short. If, if we have a Bible study and everybody leaves and it's like, okay, now, now what do I do with that? What have I done? You know, what have, how, is, how have you been taught if you can't apply it? Um, and, and that can go anyway. I mean, that can, you can apply, okay, I've learned what this word means, or I've learned what this scripture means, and now I can apply that to my own life, or I can apply it to other texts of scripture, or even if we're learning how to, you know, and I always try to teach you how to interpret scripture on your own so that you can be responsible for your own growth, you'll know now, next time you see that word again, you'll know, wait a minute, this is, this is meaning something. Words in here mean something, and I'm not picking on you, but you skipped over that word. It's and, all the way at the end of the oh, verse for me. Yeah. Says, well, whatever translation you're reading, I don't know. <laughs> now, I'm teasing you. But, but my, my point is, um, words are important. And, and the words that are in here, they're not just filler space. Remember when we were in school and you had to write like a 300-word essay? How many times did you word, use the word but or very or I or, you know, you just, you just fill it in with all of these words and then every 10 lines you're counting how many you got. That's not what's going on with scripture. These words matter and these words are in here for a reason. And this word is very important because why can he sort of lay this rebuke on them? Can he rebuke them if, this is, if they've never been taught the, the basic principles of the oracles of God? But they have been. And obviously they've been taught in a proper manner to where he with confidence can come back and say to them, look, by this time you ought to be teaching people these things, but you can't because someone needs to teach you again, a second time. You need to relearn the basic principles of the oracles of God. The basic principles of the oracles of God. What do you think that is? Any ideas what you, what you think that might be? Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again. That sounds good. I don't, I don't have a list here, but no. Roy, does Schofield share anything about the basic oracles or the basic principles of the oracles of God? Um, there's no commentary on it, no. But, but I think... But the point is, is that you wouldn't want that teaching over and over again, right? I mean, Well, here's the thing. Um, on some level, you always want to be sad... Let me, let, me, let me be careful here. It's not just the gospel. Because, I mean, I, I try to teach the gospel constantly. I try to teach it to myself. I try to read it. I pray the gospel. Not, not as if I've lost my salvation and need to be saved again. Um, but in the sense, I want to saturate my life with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then let that overflow. So I don't ever want to move away from the cross. But again, I think when you're dealing with basic principles of the oracles of God... I think the main word, or, or your translation, is elementary. I think what we need to, maybe not necessarily trying to pinpoint, it wasn't wrong what you said at all, um, but maybe instead of trying to pinpoint exactly what those things are, understanding that whatever the writer means here, he means they're basic, and they're elementary, and they are easy enough, uh, let's see, 
please don't, don't parse my words too much. Easy enough for the babe in Christ to be able to grasp and take hold of and apply to their lives. Now, these people are not babes in Christ. They're not just starting out on the Christian walk. They've obviously been established for some period of time to where they've also been taught these things already. So there should be that progression. Um, and, and I want to, well, let's get into this, and then I'm going to jump to 1 Corinthians real quick. But he says, you need milk. You need milk. Who needs milk? Babies. Babies. Now, we all need a little bit of milk, don't we? Mm-hmm. But as a main source of nourishment, babies need milk. Now, I, I, I looked this up because I found this kind of interesting. Because I've known, I've known um, a young man who was a, a teenager, and the majority of what he ate was milk. And this was years ago. Uh, he would drink almost a gallon of milk a day. And he was not a healthy young man. And so I looked it up. I did a study, or I did a study. I looked up a study that was done, and I think it was done with something like, oh, man, th- there was thousands, like 30,000 women and, and a little less men, maybe 45,000 women, 15,000 men, something like that. Over, they followed these people over a period of 22 years. And these were people that would drink like three glasses of milk a day. And, you know, a glass of milk a day is good. What, what do they say, Matt? This, I thought about you during when I, when I was looking at this study. What is a glass of milk? What do they say it does? I don't know. Strengthens our bones, man. That's why you got to start drinking milk. That's bad, no, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> they say a glass of milk will strengthen your bones, but this is what I really thought of you. They, they found out in this study, and it was more prevalent for women than men, and maybe that has to do with, with bone deterioration. I don't know. I didn't get too deep in this. I didn't want to want to go overboard with it. But... Um, they found out that people who drink, women who drink more milk, have a higher rate of mortality as they, as they age than people who didn't, and there is a higher rate of hip fracture. Now, you would think drinking milk is a good thing, but drinking too much milk by this study, and, and if you want the, I can give you the website, but um, I didn't write it down, but they say drinking too much milk can have adverse effects. And so you think about what Paul is saying here. We all need some kind of milk. We all, it, it's healthy for us to have some kind of milk. So let's kind of take this for what's being said. If milk is the basic principles of the oracles of God, because that's kind of what he's building on here. He's saying, um, you need to have someone teach you again this. You need milk. So we'll kind of we'll lay those two sort of parallel. On some level, we, as growing Christians, need a little bit of that. But that can't be our main diet, that when we come in to sit before the Word of God, or even in our own Bible studies, if all we're doing is getting milk, 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 something's wrong. We're not going to be progressing in our Christian life as the writer of Hebrews thinks we should. And if the writer of Hebrews thinks we should, then who else thinks we should be? The Holy Spirit. And so if all we're doing is getting over and over again these basic oracle or these basic principles of the oracles of God over and over and over and over and we never move out of those not away from them or, or we don't push them aside but move into other realms maybe is a better way to do it. You know, I I enjoy um I like steak. I like deer steak. I really like to enjoy rare deer steak. Um would it be wrong for me to enjoy a deer steak with a glass of milk, goat milk even, would that be, would that be wrong? No, that would be perfectly acceptable. Now, if, if it's time to eat supper and, uh, you know, it's, the steak is there and we fixed it and it can be whatever meat you want and it comes to the table and we push it aside and said, no, thank you, I'll just enjoy my milk and several glasses of it, that, that's, in, in just thinking in human terms, we would think something's wrong. Something's wrong with this person. They're not going to get the nourishment that they need. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is telling these people. If, if all you're doing, first off, number one, you need milk. You need these basic principles of the oracles of God because he said someone needs to teach you this again. So basically, you should be on solid food. You should be eating and digesting. See, that's the thing about when you come to solid food. What do we do when we eat solid food? We, we, we put it in our mouths, then what do we do? We chew it, then what do we do? It's digested. We, 
Yeah, we, are. we swallow it. We digest it. We get the, the, the good things from it. And the bad, you know, but, but what were you going to say? Uh huh. So he had that eagerness for solid food, right. nutrient. When does when does digestion begin? What what point does di- digestion begin? I remember this from health class. When you put it in your mouth. Yeah, when you begin to chew, the saliva comes and it begins to break up. What's that? Oh no, I'm, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I just I remember from food nutrition that digestion begins when you begin to chew because the breakdown begins with the saliva and all that stuff, and you begin to chew it, and and all of these things happen. So when you come to solid food, there's there's a process, you know, um, and you can even take it a little bit deeper. Solid foods, there's there's preparation involved in that a lot more than there is pouring a glass of milk. You prepare it. Um, sometimes you've got to cut into it. But at the same time, uh, you got to be careful that you're not stuffing your mouth, overstuffing. We used to have that problem with Evan. He would, he would, he would just he would ram food in his mouth when he was younger, and he would get choked. And so we had this thing. Um, you guys, some of you may remember this. Do you, you guys remember the song... Um, what does the fox say? Do you guys remember that song? Do you remember that song? It was a weird song. It was like, it was, it was bizarre. It was like, what's the fox say? And then they make all these weird noises. Like, kappa, 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 you know, just strange. Well, anyway, at that point, that song was really popular. And so was um, SpongeBob. So what we would have to do, and with this, this is what clicked in his head because he was real young. Um, we would say, don't, I think we would say, don't take fox bites, take SpongeBob bites. <laughs> SpongeBob bites were smaller bites and fox bites were big bites. And, and he got it. So, so he started taking smaller bites so he could chew it and he could swallow it. But again, the process of solid foods is, is that. Who cuts your food for you? Me. You do. Do you? <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> Frank, listen to Frank. <laughs> It would even be weird, <clears throat> and, and this is this is I'm not focusing on somebody that, that would have a need or a disability in this, but um, <clears throat> it would be really weird if I'm sitting down at supper with a steak and I push it over to Sarah and be like, "Can you cut that up for me?" When it comes to solid foods, you know, there's a process, and I'm, I'm using the imagery of steak. We cut that up, so we're involved in this. We raise it to our mouths. We we figure out the portion that we want that we chew, and and this is this is kind of telling on me. I have a weird thing about choking. I wouldn't call it a fear, but I would call it a weird thing. Because one time, have you guys ever eaten deep fried oysters? Yeah. Yeah. One thing about deep fried oysters is they don't necessarily break down as they should when you begin to chew them. And I remember I was in Memphis one time with with my dad at a restaurant, and uh, it was the first time I had deep fried oysters. And I'm chewing, and I'm chewing, and I'm chewing. I'm beginning to think, wow, this really isn't breaking down like I want it to to slide down my throat. And I'm chewing, and then I swallow, and I feel like it's not going anywhere. And so I, with all that was in me, I got it out. And I mean, I coughed that thing up. And ever since then, I just I make sure I chew my meat properly. And I chew, I don't count, but I chew it a long time. Um, but again, I'm, I'm chewing on it. I'm gnawing on it. When we come to the word of God, I think we need to apply the same purposes. If, if we don't begin to, to chew on these things, and, and just work with me on the imagery here. I think you know what I mean. Um, you know, we drink a glass of milk, it's done, we put it down, we move aside. When you chew... You begin to kind of, you take that process, you're chewing, you're tasting, the juice of it's running down, it's it's breaking up, it's all these things are happening just in the mouth, and then you swallow it. And then the body takes over and it begins to do something deeper with what you've done in your mouth. And even in chewing in that process, if you're chewing on a good steak and it tastes good, you get enjoyment out of that. There's something wonderful that, that hits your taste buds and it, and it floods your mind and all of these things begin there. There's, there's, a, there's an enjoyment in that. When we approach the word of God the same way, that's, that's going to happen. When we get into the word of God and maybe, and it's meat, we're not talking about milk. We're not talking about the basic oracles or, or basic principles of the oracles of God. We're talking about deeper stuff, like deeper stuff about Melchizedek. 
We cut a piece of that off, we stick it in our mouth, and we just chew on it for a while. We're not in a rush. We're not trying to force it down our throats. We're not just chugging a glass of milk. We're chewing on it. We're gnawing on it a little bit. We're not chewing the cud. Don't, that, that's not what the writer means. He doesn't mean anything like that. But, but we're going through this process where we're reading it. And I think the chewing part is kind of the reading it in a prayerful, thoughtful way. And then the digestive part is more like a a meditation on it. And what I mean by meditation on it is thinking deeply, not just, wow, I read that, and, and, and then moving on. You kind of camp out on that for a little bit, and you camp out on that subject, and you prayerfully consider, okay, what's being said? You go to other scriptures and you read about it and you begin to dig deep and you, you begin to study. And, and this is the way that I kind of approach um, Bible study anyway. From, from my perspective of it, for, for a teaching purpose, is, and I've shared this before, you, you dig down deep. And you get those, those jewels and those nuggets and those things that are below the surface that took a lot of effort. Now, on Sunday morning, I try to bring those things up. I try to clean them up. And I try to present them in a way that's, that's a little easier to, to ingest. Um, but there comes the point, and I think it's, it's definitely in our, in our devotional lives, where we have a responsibility for ourselves to dig deep into those places and pull out these things because go back to what the writer of Hebrews began to tell in this text of Scripture. What should we, as Christians, be doing? Teaching others. Teaching others deep things about God. And if we're not doing that, then, then when we ought to be, then we're kind of stuck on milk. We're not... See, I, the one thing I love about teaching is it forces me to go deeper in things that maybe otherwise I wouldn't go deeper in. And, and you learn a lot more about things. It's not like a teacher knows everything. It's funny to, to share that with my kids from this perspective. Because growing up, when you're, you know, when you're in high school, you think, wow, a teacher knows everything that they're teaching about. It doesn't work like that. You study, you have to brush up, and sometimes you have to go in places that you haven't gone to prepare for a lesson. And, and maybe it's stuff you may not even use. But at the same time, you're digging deep, and you're getting deep into subjects, and, and to me, I find that fascinating, and then you can bring that forth, and you can teach it, but it's also, for me, it's, it's, it's an aspect of, of my devotional life, too. It's, it's beneficial for my walk with the Lord. Um, so again, now I want you to turn real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it's funny, because when you read this, and we've already covered the authorship of Hebrews, but when you read this... Uh, you should come away with one of two things. Either Paul wrote Hebrews or somebody that was hanging out with Paul wrote Hebrews. <laughs> because when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I mean, these two things are paralleled incredibly. I mean, you can't, you can't get closer. They're saying the same things, same imagery. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1 says, But I, brothers, and that's brothers and sisters, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk. Not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you're not ready. Now, here's the interesting thing that Paul is, is, is showing here. What is he saying? He said he couldn't address them as, as spiritual people. So, infants in Christ, he's kind of making this argument. Infants in Christ receive milk when it comes to the scriptures, but... Infants in Christ aren't supposed to stay infants in Christ. And if somebody has been in Christ for a period of time and they're still in their infancy, then there's something very unspiritual about the way that they're living their life in Christ. And here's what was going on in the, in the church in Corinth. He, he lays it out, why he's addressing them, um, why he's saying, I couldn't address you as spiritual people, but, but people who are living in the flesh as infants in Christ? Because when we come to faith in Christ, do we have it all together? Do we know everything there is to know? He says, come as you are. And sometimes we come out of ignorance. The Apostle Paul said he came out of ignorance. He acted in unbelief. That's coming just as we are. And so we are infants in Christ. We need milk, but we don't stay on milk. And so he says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you're not ready for it, and not everybody's ready for it. Infants in Christ are not ready. How insane would it be to take a baby and put this child in their crib with a stake and say, good luck. <laughs> Go, you nourish yourself. I mean, that, that's, that's not going to happen. You feed them bottles, and at the beginning, you have to hold the bottle. You have to prepare the bottle, do all these things. Um, so Paul's saying, 
I, I fed you milk, not solid food. You were not ready for it. And then he says, and even now, and what, what he's saying is you should be ready for solid food, but you're still not. Even now you're not ready, for you're still the flesh. And this is why they were acting fleshly. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, in the church in Corinth there was jealousy, there was strife, they were doing things that people do, number one, who aren't believers, but people do when they first come to faith in Christ because they really, you come as you are. I mean, your testimony is a perfect example of that, not talking about jealousy and strife, but you, you came. I mean, you were plucked out, but yet there was still the hold of, of the lifestyle and, and things like that that were there. And um, so Paul is saying, and, and that's, I think that's, that's understandable for infants in Christ. We're, we're learning, um, when we come to faith in Christ, there should be a conviction of sin. There should be repentance away from that, but then we don't fully understand the depth of all of those those areas in our lives. There's some time of conviction about things that maybe we didn't, you know. It's it's kind of like the when I when I talk about the Word of God being um, sharper than a two edged sword. You know, for for me, I think when we come to faith in Christ, He begins to lop off big chunks of our lives. But as we get through those big chunks, there's some of those smaller, fine things that he needs to pull the scalpel out and begin to sort of carve and, and that are in our lives that are kind of embedded. And maybe we don't even recognize at the time that they're not good, but then over time we realize they are, and, and we've got to turn from these. And so that's, to me, that's, that's what it means to be an infant in Christ. I mean, we're, we're learning what it means to follow Jesus, and, and we're learning in one regards, the voice of the Holy Spirit. What is conviction? Is it my guilt or is it him? You know, what's, what's happening with all this? Because it's all new to us. Now, we have been born again. We're new creations. But still, that old man at the beginning is really trying to, to, to play some havoc on us and, and, and try to place himself in the forefront. So basically, though, these folks in the church in Corinth, they were acting like infants in Christ having jealousy and strife among you, and, you're, and, and you are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. And that's a question. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Paulus, are you not being merely human? So what is their jealousy and stuff? Well, hey, who led you to the Lord? Who baptized you? I was baptized by Apollos. Well, I was baptized by Paul. Well, hey, and, you know, it just kind of was going back and forth. How is that beneficial to their walk with the Lord? Because why were they, I mean, jealousy. They're, it, they're arguing over Who's better than the other person because of who baptized him or who led him to the Lord? That's, that's crazy talk, and that's, that stirs up a lot of stuff. It's jealousy first off, and then out of jealousy comes strife. And people are striving against one another and saying, well, my way is better than your way. Maybe you're not even a Christian. Because Paul didn't lead you to the Lord, but he led me to the Lord. And you've got Apollos, and Apollos didn't know, you know, he didn't know anything about Jesus. He just knew up to John the Baptist. You know, you can figure all these arguments that began to get thrown in there. And, and Paul's saying, you're acting like infants in Christ. You're acting like babies that need milk. You're acting fleshly. Even though you're Christians, you're acting fleshly. So turn back to Hebrews now. So that kind of gives us an idea of what it means to be on milk and what it means to be a babe in Christ and how people are acting. And the, the recipients of this letter, now we're not, we're not getting word that there's jealousies and strife among them, but they're dull of hearing. They're, they're, they're lazy. Is basically, I've seen it in, in a couple commentaries, it basically calls them lazy when it came to the scriptures. Um, you know, that, that can happen real, real easy. Um, especially when all we get out of our spiritual lives in the Word of God is Sunday mornings. We come, we sit, and we say, and we open our mouths and we say, feed me. And you get fed. When, when, I think when, when somebody comes to the preaching service, I hope and pray they get fed. Now, if that's all you're receiving throughout the week, as far as the Word of God and being taught it and having spiritual nourishment from the Word of God, you're starving yourself. You're not, you're not, there comes a point where you have to, um, you got to feed yourself a little bit. And that means getting in the Word, and that means getting deep in the Word, and that means not just staying on these basic principles of, of the oracles of God, getting into some solid food, getting into some difficult stuff, getting into stuff that maybe on the front end you think, man, this is boring. Like, how do you guys feel about when you come to genealogies? 
Anybody excited when they come to genealogies? I love genealogies when I read them in the scriptures. Because I don't read them how I first read them when I read them in scriptures. The first time I read them when I went through the scriptures, it was like, so-and-so begets, so-and-so, and so-and-so and begets, so-and-so. And, oh. Now, I always have this predominant thought of, wow, God knows every single person. And God knows every single generation. And God had this all planned out. And he's working through prostitutes. And he's working through horrible things and he's bringing forth the Messiah. And, and so when I read it, a genealogy I mean, comes alive. I'm not just bored with the names and how do you pronounce this name and how do you pronounce that name? It, it becomes so alive to me because it's like, man, there is so much being taught to me, not just about the genealogy, but about who God is in relation to people and his plans and his purposes. And man, it took generations to bring the Messiah. And, it, and from a human standpoint, Man, this thing has gotten way off course. I mean, you read the Old Testament, there is some shady stuff going on. Well, you said how many generations were you from David? I don't know. I don't remember. 128. Yeah, <laughs> go figure that. Yeah. Take that with a grain of salt. Um, but anyway, the, the point of it is, and, and, and I'm not talking about that kind of genealogy. I, I enjoy like my family genealogy, but, but certainly scripture genealogy, um, it comes alive to me. Because now if I just read it on the surface and I kind of approach it sort of with a presupposition of this is going to be boring, it's going to be boring. But things on one hand that may start off boring when we dig a little deeper and we realize, okay, it's kind of milky on the top, but man, there's, it's like yogurt <laughs> with fruit. <laughs> the top, you know, you got that liquid in there, but you dig down below that, and it's like, wow, there's, there's some real sustenance here. But I got to dig deeper than just what's laying on the top. And, and a genealogy is just one excuse or one, one example because people don't like to read the genealogies. They just want to blast through it. But it's not boring when you dig deeper and you follow and you trace the history and all of these things. So to me, again, that's, that's, that's getting deep into the word of God. That's, that's taking it, chewing it. Genealogies become solid food when we dig deeper than just the juice that's on the surface of it. So he's saying here, he says, you need milk, not solid food. He understands that about him. And, and, and he's not saying, I'm going to ram this solid food down your throat. He's saying, you need milk. But then he also, because they need to be taught again, but he says in verse 13, for everyone who lives on milk, and this is the indictment, this is the, what I would call a gentle rebuke. Because obviously, he didn't start off with a rebuke of these people. Did, did the writer of Hebrews know that this was kind of their, their lot at this point in their Christian walk? Did he know this in the beginning of writing this letter? I'd say he did. He didn't start off with that. He didn't start off, you Hebrew Christians are babes in Christ. You're sucking on milk and you need solid food. You ought to be making disciples, but somebody needs to decide. Had he started off that in the beginning, what do you think their response would be maybe to the rest of the letter? Ugh, man, beat up. Nobody likes to get beat up on the front end. Sometimes if you, just in dealing with people, if, if you have to confront them with something, um, and this isn't manipulative, this is just, a, I think, a, a tactful, gentle way, um, you know, you approach them in a way of, of dealing with the good, and then maybe you have to deal with harder stuff, but, but you're not just coming at them going, bah, you know, shame on you, this is horrible, and you're, you're awful, and you leave them feeling... Awful. That's not what the writer of Hebrews is wanting to do to them. He's wanting to exhort them. He's wanting to lift them up. But sometimes, he, he, at the same time, we have to have the reality of where we are, and sometimes that stings a little bit. But to me, those are what I call glorious failures. When we realize, okay, I failed in this regard, or I'm not doing all that I should in this area, well then, okay, I need, I need more emphasis here. Lord, help me in this area in my life. Help me to, to desire to get deeper in the Word of God, to dig deeper, to, to study it, to, to chew it, to ingest it, to, to just really have this solid food. If you recognize that you're not doing that, then, hey, that's an opportunity to hand that over to the Lord and see Him move in your life. I mean, that, that's a positive thing. It's not just, here's the difference. If, you, if what I always try to, to say, the difference between conviction of the Holy Spirit and Satan trying to knock you down. When Satan tries to knock you down with something, 
it'll be in the sense of like a fatal blow. Like that's the end of it. He's knocked you down. Or, you know, he'll say something like, man, you have failed in this area. Why would God even want to deal with you anymore? And he stops. Now, when, we're, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, you have failed in this area, but God is gracious. And God will discipline those whom he loves because you're his children. But in the end, you're going to be stronger. So it's not like this kind of fatal aspect of you screwed up and man, you're forsaken. It's, yeah, you screwed up, but you're not forsaken. You're, you're, you're loved and you're a child of the king. And he's going he's gonna to pick you up. He's going to lift up your head again. But you do need to be disciplined. And, and that's the thing. And Paul talks about that. You know, we need to be disciplined at times in our Christian walk by the Lord, not by our enemy who just wants to knock us down. So there's a good way of, of difference. You know, if you feel, man, I'm being so convicted, but it's in a fatalistic sense, then you may need to, to, to question the spirits on that one and say, where's that one coming from? Is it because Jesus, man, when he convicts me, yeah, it, it hurts. But it's not in this ending kind of way. It's I'm convicting you because I want to help you. I want to, to be with you and, and I'm not leaving you and I'm not forsaking you. There's, um, there's an aspect of, of the eternal life that I have where Satan, when he'll convict you or try to convict you or convince you of something, um, he'll make you want to think, well, you've lost your eternal life. It's gone. You know, hey, God's, why would God deal with you? You know, you're... You're supposed to be strong in their faith, and here you are weak. Why would God want to continue to, to deal with you? That's not, how, that's not how God, that's not how the Holy Spirit convicts us. Um, because again, here he's saying, you need milk, not solid food, but they're going to get some solid food. He's not done teaching on, on Melchizedek. He's not saying forget it, but he's also at the same time awakening them. And we don't know how these letters when? We don't know if they got these letters and sat down in a five-hour reading and then that was the end of it. Maybe they read this and they stopped and put the brakes on and said, we need to, we need to focus on this. I don't, I don't know how they approached these letters. Um, but still, he goes back to teaching on Melchizedek. And maybe at that point when they come back to this teaching of Melchizedek and get over this parenthesis, maybe they realized, okay, we need to put our thinking caps on a little bit. You know, we need to, to not just sit there like a uh, baby bird. Have you ever watched a baby bird in the, in the, uh, in the nest? Like we had, um, we, had, we had finches. We had finches that had babies. It was really cool. And yeah, and, but what was really weird is I would watch them when the, when the mother would, or the father would come to feed them. And they would open their mouths. And it was really bizarre. That their tongue would go back and forth. Just, um, it was really interesting to see. But and maybe that was them just kind of, maybe they were vocalizing something I couldn't really hear. But um, that's, that's not necessarily how we need to be. People are like that sometimes on Sunday morning, and I get that, and that's, that's one thing. But, but when we're at home, we shouldn't just kind of open our mouths and our tongues are going back and forth saying, feed me. We've got to get into it ourselves. We've got we to gotta take some responsibility, cut off that meat, chew it, and digest it, ingest it in our lives on our own. So he says, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So what he's saying to them is, you ought to be teachers skilled in the word of righteousness, but you're not. So if all we're getting is milk, this is what it's telling us. If all we're getting is, is the basic principles of the oracles of God, which are important, but if that's all our diet consists of, then we are unskilled in the word of righteousness. And then he gives a, a pretty strong rebuke since he is a child. That's where it's time to grow up. He's an infant in Christ. At this point, he ought not to be an infant in Christ. At this point, yes, milk is part of his diet, but so is meat. So therefore, let's kind of reverse this. If that's the, the diet that he has as a Christian when he comes to the word of God, then he will be skilled in the word of righteousness, and he will no longer be a child. And that's, that's the progression that we're supposed to be on in our walk with the Lord. If we're not feeling like we're growing in the word of God in the sense of applying um, what we know about Jesus, if our, how can I put it? I don't, I don't want to say if our faith is not getting stronger, but um, if, if, our, if our understanding and our walk is not getting deeper and richer with Jesus as time goes on, then we may need to take a step back from the table and look what's laid before us and what, what are we bringing to the table to, to eat 
Is it milk or is it solid food? And if we've been walking with the Lord, then, yeah, we need to get into some solid food. We need to get into some solid teaching. Um, an example of this is, is of not doing this, and it's kind of different. It's not in the Word of God, but um, it's, it's along the lines of when you come to something difficult and you shut down. I, I know I've talked about this at some point, but at our church in Florida, um, we had a choir, but we didn't have a music minister. So as pastor, I became the music minister too. And, and so I got the bright idea because I never just, I didn't feel led to just, let's just sing the, the hymns everybody knows. Let's learn some new stuff. You know, let's challenge ourselves. That's, that was my thing. I think I told it to them. Let's challenge ourselves. We wear robes when we sing on Sunday morning. We've got a great pianist. Let's challenge ourselves. So I bring them a new song and they would sit there and they go, we can't do this. We don't know this song. We've never done this song before. We can't, we can't do this. And I would tell him, you can do this. It's not going to be easy. And yes, you're going to have to learn a new song. And it wasn't, it wasn't even a contemporary song. It was just a song they didn't know. And it was probably a, um, a Charles Wesley song, you know, which, is, which are pretty, I think, theologically amazing. But it was, it was something like that. And it was like, no, nah, we, we can't do this. And I could see people just shutting down. And, and it's like, don't shut down. I mean, yes, there's... there's an obstacle ahead of you, and it's not easy, and it's going to take some work, but when you, when you do that, and you apply that, and you, and you break through that, man, there's, there is a sense of accomplishment. And I'm not talking about pridefulness, patting yourself on the back, but it's like, man, I didn't think I could do it, but by God's grace, I can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can learn a new song. I can dig deep in the Word of God like I've never dug before, and I can attack areas in Scripture that I've stayed away from because... Maybe I didn't understand it. I can remember the first time I really read through the book of Romans. And I kind of stayed away from the book of Romans a little bit because it was kind of frightening to me. I don't know why, but it was just like intimidating is probably the better part. But when I had my surgery in six weeks, I'm, I'm laid up in the bed. I said, I'm going to the book of Romans. And I'd read, you know, I'd read like chapter 8, you know, and I'd read chapter 1. But I hadn't read like chapter 7, chapter 9, and chapter 11. I hadn't gone through the book of Romans. And I said, you know what, I'm going through the book of Romans. I got time. And, and now it's one of my favorite books. I love it. The, the, the deep theology that's in the book of Romans is, is so nourishing to my spiritual soul that it's, it is by far one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book. Um, but had I just said, you know, it's just, it's intimidating. I think that's really what it was. I remember when I was in seminary and we had a class on Isaiah and we got through Isaiah and one of the students who was above me in, in, in years, um, not age, but, but in class, he said, well, I know one thing now I'm not smart enough to teach through the book of Isaiah. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I thought that's not the point. I mean, that's not, it's not you. It's not you. It's, it's the Holy spirit. But at the same time, Challenge yourself. I mean, you want to learn about a book, start teaching through it. I've never gone through the book of Hebrews like I'm going through now. I've gone through chapter 11. Hey, and this is a good thing. I was going through my office and my old stuff, and I found my study on the book of or chapter 11 in Hebrews. It takes about a year and a half to go through. <laughs> but it's a great study. Um, but I found it. So anyway, we'll worry about that when we get to it. <laughs> but um, don't shut down when it comes to difficult stuff. Um, walk into that challenge by trusting in the Holy Spirit who is the one who teaches you. Become, get off the milk, get on some solid food, and become skilled in the word of righteousness. I'm not talking about your being a pastor or a seminary education or anything like that. I'm talking about read the word of God and be taught of the Holy Spirit. Don't be a child anymore. Don't be an infant in the faith. He said, but solid food is for the mature. That's a good thing. So if we're maturing in Christ... It's because we're, we're getting into some deeper stuff. Because for those who have their powers of discernment by... I mean, read this whole sentence. But solid food is for the mature. And this is who the mature are. Okay? So he explains it. He doesn't just say solid food is for the mature. He explains who the mature is. He says, for those... And this is mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good and evil discernment. He's not talking about here discernment as a gift of the Spirit. While, while it is, we use discernment every day in our lives in one way or another. And I think the context that he is talking about here 
is if all you're doing is staying on milk and you're in your infancy in Christ, then you are becoming or have become biblically ignorant. And that's not maturing in the faith. And so as you mature in the faith and in the word of God, you begin to develop discernment, which ultimately is a biblical worldview. Because discerning between good and evil in a world, that is having a biblical worldview. So if you see, if, and, and we've all known Christians who, who, who don't have a solid biblical worldview. And I would be willing to bet, taking the word of God here at, at face value, if you go back and you ask them, well, what's your devotion life like? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> devotion? I mean, when you're in the Word of God, you mean on Sunday mornings? No, I mean, when you're studying, when you're in the Word of God, what are you studying in the Word of God? Well, I don't know. I've never looked at it like that. I think you can, taking this at its, at its value and going backwards, and if you see people who cannot distinguish good and evil and they have no, dis- no powers of discernment, we can make an assessment that they are immature, that they're on milk, and that they're infants in Christ, that they're unskilled in the word of righteousness, and they're on milk. Because they're not, they're not going deeper in the word of God. I mean, what a privilege we have. We got, we got it all. You know, these, these Hebrew Christians at this point, what did they have as their Bible? Chances are, chances are they only had the Old Testament, and that's it. And there's enough in the Old Testament for them to be indicted of just having milk and not going deeper. But we got the whole thing. You know, we, we've got the life of Jesus. Four different perspectives. We got it. And then we got the book of Acts. We got the early church. We know what, what, what the Holy Spirit was doing with, with people in the beginning. And then we've got the, the things that teach us how to live this Christian life. And what does it mean? And troubles that people have. And pitfalls and, and things like that. And then we got the back of the book. Which is yet to come. But we know how it all ends. Well, there's no excuse to not go deeper in the word of God, to not be maturing from milk to solid foods. Because if we don't, here is the risk. And again, my subheading calls it apostasy. I don't know if, I mean, I look at apostasy as much harsher than that. I look at it as biblical ignorance. That's, that's what I would call it. And you're going to have a mixed up, well, let me, let me, you're not going to have a biblical worldview. You will have a worldview, but you will have things of the world creep in to your worldview, I'm going to, I'll step out on a, on a limb here. Um, uh, yeah, let's just do it. I think when people come to a point, um, and I'll use homosexuality as, as, as the thing that I'm talking about here. Because again, you can read in the scripture and it takes homosexuality and it lists it among regular sins. And I think I talked about this in Sunday school. Um, Anybody would agree, yeah, those are sins. And then we come to homosexuality and we say, eh, no, that's just cultural. It needs to be plucked out of there. That's, that's, not, that's not what it means. Then what we begin to do, because we're no longer digging deep into the word of God, you know, we're, we're kind of taking stuff on a surface level. Then we begin to view homosexuality as the world views homosexuality. And then that creeps into our worldview. And then we get totally, and I'm, again, I'm just using this as an example because it is happening in churches. And then we begin to, to entertain, well, when, when, when Paul wrote homosexuality, he didn't really mean it like we mean it today. And so it's, it, you know, God... God created you that way, and God doesn't make mistakes and all of this stuff. And, and so then your, your whole biblical worldview is out of, it, it, it's just skewed. It's, it's totally out of where it needs to be and how it should be in line with what the scripture says. Because again, reading a basic list of sins, that's pretty easy to do. There's no reason to pluck one thing out of that. But culture says you have to pluck this out. And if we're not digging deep in the scripture and we don't trust the scripture to to feed us the meat, and all we want is just the basic principles and the oracles of God and things that make us feel good, 
then we won't go to that, and then we'll be in, you're going to be influenced one way or another, either from the Word of God or from the world outside, and that is going to view how you, or that is going to affect how you view the world. And if we're not digging deep into the Word of God and all we're getting is milk, we'll become biblically ignorant, and then we'll approach things that God forbids and says are sin, no matter, you know, it transcends culture and time um, and, and popular world media and things like that. Um, and then it's going to affect how we begin to interpret that. And it doesn't stop there. If we begin to pluck something out of context in one thing and begin to look at it culturally, that's going to move on to other areas in the Bible. And there are those critics of the scriptures that begin to look at the words of Jesus and say, well, Jesus didn't really say all these things. And let's boil it down to, to what he did say. And let's get rid of the miracles because, you know, I, I, nobody, that's probably just the writers added that in there to try. You know, it's propaganda. So let's get rid of that. And before you know it, you've got a Bible that's, that's this thick. And it's got nothing but milk. Even, even it's like, anybody drink skim milk? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> skim milk is, like, skim like milk is disgusting. I'm sorry. I mean, I've had, to, I've had to drink it at times in my life. Or I think maybe during wrestling, I think I had to drink it or something. But uh, skim milk is, is just useless. I mean, I grew up on 2%. I don't drink 2% now. I drink whole milk. <laughs> If I had a cow, I'd drink it straight from the cow. But um, two percent's bad. But <laughs> skim milk is ridiculous. Uh, you know, I like the. You know, I like the red. I like the. Give me the whole, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I know people who grew up on like straight cow's milk, unpasteurized, and man, they love it, and they got so much out of it, and. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, our bodies are. Um, but, you know, if we begin to take things out of the word of God, we're, it's not then that we're just getting and we become critical of the things in the word of God. It's not then that we're just getting milk. We're getting skim milk and you may as well just drink water. And he's not talking about water here. So anyway, my point in this and this, here's how we should apply this in our lives. And, and, and again, the conversation in Hebrews is not over just because we're ending here at the chapter break. We'll pick it up when we come back because he's not done yet speaking about this. Um, but, you know, we need to, we need to, to get into our life. If you're, if, you're, if, you're in, if you're on milk and you're not a new believer, then, then dig deeper. If you're digging deeper already, then keep digging. I think that's how we can apply this in our lives. Don't, um, you know, search out the tough stuff. Don't just take an easy approach to the study of the Word of God. Dig, dig deep, you know. Read things that make you uncomfortable. Read things that are over your head. And then prayerfully uh, hand these over to the Lord and say, teach me. I remember when I first came across anything of, of eschatology in the end times, and man, it was over my head because I was a young believer, and I was like, Lord, I really want to understand this. And before I knew it, God was putting writings in my, and in, in, it was the Left Behind series, like that, that found its way into my life, but I didn't stop there. When I read that, then I went back to the scripture. I said, what is this saying in the Bible? And that led me into a deep study of not just a fictional work on somebody's interpretation of it, but it led me to the word of God. Had I just stayed, in, and I'll say this, had I just stayed in the Left Behind series and that was my, that was my theology, uh, that's milky. Yeah. <laughs> that's skim milky. Um, but, but it drove me to the word of God to where, and I wasn't, in, so I wasn't even called to ministry at this time, but I just I wanted to know and I wanted to get deep and I wanted to learn. And so I asked God, teach me these things because I don't know anything about it, but I want to know about it because it's in your word. So let's, let's do that. Let's strive to, to not be biblically ignorant people. Let's strive to, to get deep in the word of God and then apply the truths that we know to our lives. So that's, that's what I would say that the application is. I would say it's, it's easy to stay on milk because it's easy. Yes. Yeah, you know? I agree. And, yeah. and you can survive on it. Yeah. But again, like you say, that desiring to move forward with God is always a good indicator that that you're moving in the right direction. Yeah, it's like what Andy said about his, was it your nephew? You know, when, when he tasted solid meat, he's like, yeah, I'm in. And I think that that's what will happen in our lives. When we taste the solid meat, and it's like, okay, milk is good, 
man, there's something rich in this that I'm not getting from the milk, and, and you'll want more of it, and, and you'll, you'll desire that. And, and ultimately, when it comes to the Word of God, that desire is just not from you. It's not like you woke up one day and said, oh, I'm going to desire this. I mean, that's God working in your life, just what you're saying. Yeah. And it goes with the flow and how they take parts of the Bible and make it more milky. Right. Well, milk's just a liquid. It goes with the flow, so it's not going to challenge anything. Right. I don't want to say they're selling out, but in a sense, they are selling out. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, okay, I'm, I have it sitting here, and it's not sitting here because I want to talk about it. It's sitting here because I need to take it home and keep reading it. But um, Pilgrim's Progress, I mean, that, that's basically what the whole story is. By the way, I'm in part two in Christiana, and I've never read it before. I'm about 30 pages in. I love, I love part two. It is. Have you ever read part two? Yeah, I definitely have. I can't. Man, read part it. two is like. Now I wouldn't read part two in lieu of part one. Yeah, and yeah, and then, yeah, and you've got you've got this. You know, Christiana is is Christian's wife, and and she's now following the path, and she she's just repenting of all her sins of how she mocked her husband, who's now dead. He's gone. He's in the celestial city. He's in heaven, and and. She gets an invite from the king to, to go to come and sit at the king's table. And there's a woman that, that goes with her named Mercy. And, well, Christiana and her sons, they entered the wicked, wicked gate. And that's, that's ultimately when you come to faith in Christ, when you enter the wicked gate. Well, Mercy doesn't get in. And she's ready to just, like, she doesn't know what to do. And so she starts to knock. And then she starts to pound so much that it scares Christiana. And, and then finally the Lord comes and opens the wicked gate and invites her in. And then later they're having this conversation and she asks uh, Christiana, she's like, man, was he upset that I was knocking so loud? She said, eh, just the opposite. He kind of had a grin on his face that you were knocking so loud to want in. And, um, but you read about their trials and their tribulations and, and what it took and, and it all boils down, you know, through many trials and tribulations we must go through to enter the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't mean we purchase it, but that means in this life, that's what we're going to face. Um, how do we endure those? Milk's not going to get you through it, but solid food will. Solid, you know, getting deep in the word of God is going to get you through those times. Um, those who, who, who are infants in Christ and have to go through stuff... Um, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough in that regards because it does, kind of in that same book, um, when Christian comes to his first obstacle, he's got two guys with him, obstinate and pliable. Obstinate says, I'm not believing this, I'm gone. Pliable says, hey, this sounds good, I'll walk with you, until he falls into a swampy bog and he gets covered in mud and he's like, that's it, I'm done, this isn't worth it. It's this hard on the front end. How, how hard is it going to be on the, on the end? He said, I'm going home. And he goes home, and we saw it last mm-hmm. night. He's mocked by unbelievers. He's not a believer, but he's mocked by those people and be like, man, if I had done that, I wouldn't have given up so easy. And that's the thing. The Christian life is not about giving up. We've got to persevere and persevere to the end. And those who persevere to the end will be what? Saved. But I believe that the saved will persevere to the end because, again, we are depending upon one who's already done it, who's already purchased it, who said he would not leave us nor forsake us, and he has given us his spirit, a deposit of guarantee in our lives to get us through this. So, again, but back to the responsibility for our own growth. We have a responsibility to get in the word of God, and then when we come to these hard times, apply what we know about God in the deeper truths, not just the basic principles of the oracles of God, but in the deeper truths that will get you out of those muddy, swampy bogs because you're, you're, you're deep. You have a nourishment that's, that's, you're not an infant in Christ. You're progressing. And so.